welcome. Thank you for joining us. Um, we'll go ahead and get started on the Promoting Immigrant Health webinar today. So in today's presentation, you'll hear new survey data on immigrant experiences related to their health and well-being. You'll hear about public health and healthcare researchers and how they can support advocacy for policy improvements. And after the webinar, we'll be sending an updated guide on tips for using data to end health disparities and strengthen communities. So just quickly to go over the agenda, I'll give some introductions and a background, and then we'll take a look at the data uh, with KFF and their Immigrant Experience Survey. And then we'll turn it to the Protecting Immigrant Families Coalition and hear about advocacy. Um, and then we'll have a Q&A. In between each of the sections, we'll stop and have questions from the audience. So if you'd like to ask any questions, please put them in the Q&A um, section. We'll close the chat in five minutes. Um, and then we'll take your questions at those pauses. And then again, at the end, we'll reserve 15 minutes or so have some questions. Um, I want to give a little bit of introduction to community science. At community science, we seek to build power, resources, and engagement of historically disadvantaged communities through trainings, evaluation, and research. My name is Mysoon Frage. I'm a senior associate for health equity here. Along with my colleagues, I'm seeking to support culturally responsive initiatives that promote racial equity and immigrant inclusion in the US, primarily through research and evaluation. I've been part of the researcher work group that's organized by the Protecting Immigrant Families Coalition for about two years, and Community Science is now a member of that coalition. I'm so pleased that my colleagues have agreed to participate in the session today. So I want to take a couple moments to introduce them. Samantha Ortiga is the Vice President of Racial Equity and Health Policy at KFF. Her program provides timely and reliable data, information, and policy analysis on health and health care disparities affecting people of color, immigrants, and other underserved groups, as well as efforts to advance racial equity and health. Samantha previously served as the Associate Director for KFF's program on Medicaid and the Uninsured. Drishti Pillai is the Director of Immigrant Policy at KFF. She oversees data and policy analysis regarding healthcare access for immigrant communities. Prior to joining KFF, she was the Research Director at the National Asian Pacific American Women's Forum and held research and faculty positions at George Washington University. Chasey Anderson is the Deputy Director of Protecting Immigrant Families Coalition. Throughout her career, Chasey's work has focused at the intersection of children's issues, healthcare and public benefits and immigration. Previously, she was the Director of Immigration and Policy and Advocacy at the Children's Defense Fund of Texas and worked on the healthcare team for the Center of Public Policy Priorities, now Every Texan. So for a bit of background, uh, for the purposes of this presentation, we'll use the term immigrant as shown here or people living in a country they were not born in. Unless we specify, we're not referring to any particular type of legal status, such as refugee or asylee. Citing the Migration Policy Institute, worldwide, the United States is home to more international migrants than any other country, and more than the next four countries combined, those being Germany, Saudi Arabia, Russia, and the United Kingdom, as shown in dark blue on this map. While the United States population represents about 5% of the total world population, close to 20% of all global migrants reside in the United States, making up about 15% of the US population in 2020, and this varied greatly by state. Um, as community science seeks to accelerate equity, we want to recognize that immigrants are diverse in terms of their migration journeys, as well as their experiences in the US, and that to enable environments where everyone has fair and just opportunities to attain their highest levels of health, we must meet people where they are at and work together with communities to harness data for improvements. We approach this task with the understanding that everyone has the right to good health, that people should not have to earn or demonstrate their worthiness to achieve good health, and that structural challenges that create inequities can and should be overcome. Before we launch into the presentations of new data, 
and of how data can be used to achieve policy changes. I want to share key questions that we can ask using data to understand and address health disparities. These come from a guide developed by Community Science for the HHS Office of Minority Health. And we'll, as I said, we'll be sharing this tip sheet from this guide after the session. Um, the questions basically are, what is the starting point? Meaning what populations would you like to focus on? What locations are they? What time period? So forth. What disparity are you focusing on? And compared to which population? What are the social determinants of health or the non-health non factors that affect that disparity? What are the data gaps and what can you do to fill those gaps? What is the story you can tell to describe the situation? And how can you use data to build healthier communities? We wanna stress the importance of critically thinking about data and using data to create positive outcomes for many groups in your communities rather than divisions. So with that, I'm going to turn it over to um, our colleagues at KFF, and I will be running the slides. So I'll try to keep an eye on when you're ready to go on next. Great, thank you so much. Uh, Drishti and I are both really pleased to have the opportunity to present today. Um, and I think those questions are a perfect segue into these new survey data that we're gonna present. Um, so you can go ahead and, and move to the next slide. We're gonna be presenting data from uh, a recently released survey project focused on the immigrant experience. All the findings you'll hear presented today are available on our website at kff.org. And we're gonna be continuing to issue additional reports out of this survey set over time. Um, so keep an eye on the website for even more analysis coming out of this uh, survey. Uh, so this was an, an initial round of an ongoing survey project that we are conducting at KFF that is really designed to fill gaps in understanding the immigrant experience. We're planning um, an ongoing series of large scale surveys that will focus on understanding social and economic circumstances, health and access to healthcare, experiences with unfair treatment and discrimination, as well as attitudes on key social and policy issues among immigrant communities in the US. This initial round of the survey um, was conducted in partnership with the LA Times. And at the end of the presentation, we'll show you a little bit of what their reporting off of the survey looked like. We also engaged a panel of community experts uh, from organizations that serve the communities included in the survey to help inform the design and implementation of the survey as well as dissemination of the findings. Um, and then we accompanied the survey effort um, with focus groups um, among immigrants in a variety of languages and from different areas of the world that were really designed to help us improve the design of the survey and then also help to expand and deepen uh, the survey findings with more personalized storytelling and individual experiences. Um, and this is part of a much broader effort at KFF focused on um, centering and uplifting the experiences of groups that are historically underrepresented in policy discussions. Next slide, there we go. Um, so I don't want to get too deep in the methodology of this survey. I will say it was, um, I think, the most expensive and challenging and complex survey we've conducted at KFF to date, which is saying a lot because our um, polling and survey research team who we conducted this in partnership with um, are really experts in the world of polling and survey research and particularly um, with population groups that are um, often up underrepresented in survey research. A few details on the sampling are here. Um, at, a, at a bigger picture level, I will say this is the largest nationally representative sample um, a survey of uh, focused on immigrants that has been conducted to date. We had over 3,300 respondents um, and together those respondents are representative of immigrants nationally within the US. Uh, achieving this representative sample really required a complex and challenging approach that involved three different survey modes. So phone, online, and paper, translation into 10 languages. Um, and really that 
complexity and all those modes was needed in order to reach some of the experiences among lower income individuals, as well as those with limited English proficiency. Um, this large sample size allows us to really dive into the diversity of the immigrant experience by a variety of different characteristics that you can see here on the slide. So not only can we understand experiences by some of the standard demographics like gender, age, and income, but we can also understand experiences by different factors like length of time in the U.S., importantly by immigration status, English proficiency, as well as geography with some breakouts by both countries of origin and region of origin. Um, and with that, I was going to pass it to Drishti and let's may soon. Do you have um, anything you want to follow up on on the scope of the survey? Yeah, if you wouldn't mind, I, I, I know you gave a lot of your rationale for the survey, but could if you could you talk a little bit more about, you know, why did KFF make this investment? Like, what were the driving factors for it, really? So I think really one of KFF's core missions is to help increase understanding and awareness of how policy affects people, and particularly people that have historically been marginalized and underrepresented in um, policy discussions. This specific survey project sits within a broader portfolio of work at KFF, which includes other survey work as well as qualitative work that are focused on centering voices and experiences. Um, we have a forthcoming survey that we'll release next month that is really focused on understanding experiences with racism and discrimination um, and what that looks like across different population groups. We also are planning some work to better understand the experiences of smaller populations population groups that um, often are not represented in survey research, including indigenous populations. Um, and we really made investments in this work and are committed to this work going forward. Um, and going forward, we'll also be looking for other funding partners um, to help us enhance that work. Um, and and I envision that this work may evolve over time. The beauty of having this long, longer term horizon and planning to do this over time is that we can evolve the surveys to adapt to different topics of focus, um, to different specific populations of focus, um, depending on what is going on in the policy environment at the time. Um, but all of it sits within this broader framework of trying to make sure that voices are represented and particularly those voices that are often not heard during policy debates. Thank you. Thank you. Um, so just delving into some of the main takeaways from our survey, uh, we found that a majority of immigrants say that they are better off as a result of moving to the US. Uh, however, many face substantial challenges when it comes to making ends meet, um, such as affording basic needs and paying monthly bills. Uh, they face challenges at work and in their communities, including anti-immigrant uh, discrimination and harassment. Uh, we also found that immigrants face substantial challenges accessing and using healthcare due to high uninsured rates among some groups of immigrants, as well as a lack of culturally competent and language accessible care. Uh, and the survey also found that uh, a substantial share of immigrants have immigration related fears and confusions that affect their daily lives. Another key takeaway was that sub certain subgroups of immigrants um, consistently report experiencing greater challenges. Uh, and this speaks to the intersectionality uh, of some of these identities. We found that black and Hispanic immigrants uh, generally report uh, facing more challenges than immigrants of other races. Immigrants who have limited English proficiency, uh, which is defined as speaking English less than very well, also face substantially greater challenges, as do immigrants who are likely undocumented, which for the purposes of our survey uh, were defined as people who do not have citizenship, a green card, or a valid work or student visa. Uh, yet, despite these hardships, most immigrants say that they would come to the US again. Next slide, please. Uh, and we can kind of see this, um, you know, immigrants in their own words describing why they've come to the U.S. with many saying that it's for better educational opportunities for themselves or their children uh, and better economic uh, and financial opportunities. 
So we found that employment was a common reason uh, that immigrants cited for moving to the US. Uh, and in fact, about eight and 10 immigrants between the ages of 30 and 64, 64 are working. However, close to half have said that they have faced some form of workplace mistreatment. And this includes giving fewer, being given fewer opportunities for promotion, not being paid as much as their US born counterparts, being given worse shifts, being harassed or threatened. Uh, and overall, while half of immigrants um, report ever facing these, we again, we see that the shares of black and Hispanic immigrants who report these challenges are higher um, than immigrants overall. So even outside of work, uh, immigrants have experienced harassment and discrimination in their communities. Um, and this takes many forms, such as being criticized or insulted for speaking a language other than English, being told to go back to where you came from, uh, or being treated worse than US born people in certain settings, such as in a store or a restaurant, in interactions with the police. And again, we see that Black and Hispanic immigrants are more likely to say that they have experienced these forms of mistreatment than immigrants overall. Sorry, there's a little lag. Oh, yes, there we right. go. Um, so, getting into some of the healthcare related findings. Uh, we found that more than one in seven immigrant adults report being uninsured. And this includes half of likely undocumented immigrant adults. So we clearly see that immigration status um, has a significant association with whether or not um, immigrants have health coverage with, with naturalized citizens uh, being very less likely uh, to be uninsured on par with US born adults. Um, one in five law lawfully present immigrants saying they're uninsured and then the share rising to 50% among those who are likely undocumented. We also found that state coverage policies make a difference in coverage rates for immigrants. Uh, so we had sufficient samples to compare immigrants in California and Texas and found that while rates of private health coverage are similar across the two states, uh, there is a significant difference in uninsured rates with immigrants in Texas being three times more likely than immigrants in California to be uninsured uh, and Medicaid in California making up that difference. Uh, so as we know, California is a state that has expanded Medicaid to low income adults and they also offer coverage to immigrants regardless of status. Uh, and also when grouping states more broadly based on their coverage policies, so states such as California offering more expansive coverage and states such as Texas, which offer less expansive coverage, we see that these differences still hold uh, with states with more expansive coverage having half the uninsured rates among immigrants as compared to states that have less expansive coverage. Uh, and as we know, um, having coverage makes a key difference in whether and when individuals can get the healthcare that they need. We found that about one in five immigrant adults said that they skipped or postponed healthcare in the past year for any reason. Um, and one in, ten, uh, one in 10 said that their health got worse as a result. Uh, and we see huge differences based on insurance status with individuals who are uninsured being much more likely to say both that they skipped or postponed care and that their health got worse as a result as compared to immigrants who have insurance. Uh, beyond barriers to accessing healthcare, um, our survey also revealed disparities in experiences within the healthcare system. We found that one in four immigrants said that they felt like a US doctor or healthcare provider treated them differently or unfairly uh, due to any of the following reasons, which include their insurance status or ability to pay, their accent or how well they speak English um, or their race, ethnicity or skin color. And again, we see black and Hispanic immigrants reporting facing more challenges than other immigrants, um, especially black immigrants when it comes to saying that they faced unfair treatment due to their race, ethnicity, um, or skin color. Thank you. Similarly, we found that about three in 10 immigrant adults report challenges obtaining respect for, respectful or culturally competent care. Um, and these challenges may include a healthcare provider not taking the time to listen to your concerns, uh, front office staff treating you with disrespect, um, not knowing how to navigate health services uh, or lang language accessible services not being available for immigrants with limited English proficiency. 
And yes, across the board, we see that about um, three in 10 immigrants report this, again, with shares being higher among Black immigrants and Hispanic immigrants. Coming to immigration-related fears, uh, we found that uh, immigrants, substantial shares of immigrants, again, report certain immigration-related worries, such as uh, being worried about getting detained or deported, avoiding things like talking to the police due to fear of drawing attention to their immigration status, or even avoiding applying for government benefits. And we see clear differences by immigration status here with individuals who are likely undocumented being much more likely uh, than lawfully present immigrants and naturalized citizens to experience any of these, including seven in 10 who say that they worry that they are a family member will be detained or deported. Um, Drishi, can I pause for one second here? Because we have some questions about the likely undocumented. And could you just elaborate on how you identify people as being likely undocumented? Uh, yeah, so overall, in terms of how our sample was reached, we used a probability-based sampling method, which included address-based sampling, random digit dialing. And then off our survey response, off this probability-based sample, individuals who said that they do not have citizenship, they do not have a green card, and that they do not have a valid work or student visa were classified as being likely undocumented. So it was based on their responses to the survey, basically, yes. not yeah. not anything that they said. Yeah. Okay. Uh, I'll have a couple questions for you later too, but we'll keep going. Okay. Uh, okay. Uh, and finally, we found that a majority of immigrant adults, regardless of immigration status, say that they are not sure about public charge rules. Um, as we know, um, using government non-cash government benefits to help pay for housing, healthcare, or food are not considered in public charge to determinations when determining uh, whether someone's status should be adjusted to um, being a lawful permanent resident. However, in our survey, we found that across different immigration statuses, more than half of immigrants said that they were not sure how public charge policies work, uh, and about one in seven incorrectly believed uh, that the use of such benefits would be counted towards public charge determinations. Uh, and again, we saw higher shares of likely undocumented immigrants being confused or having misinformation uh, with roughly nine and 10 likely undocumented immigrants saying they're not sure um, or incorrectly believing um, how the public charge policies work. Um, can I pause one second here and also ask you, do you have data on the use of public benefits among immigrants and also the U.S. populations and how the public charge fears are impacting use? Yes. So we, um, based on our survey, we found that about three in 10 of both U.S. born citizens as well as immigrants um, say that they have used public assistance for housing, healthcare, or food in the past 12 months. Uh, and this is despite the fact that immigrants uh, live in lower income households as compared to US born citizens. Uh, so this is in part driven by these fears and confusion about how public charge policies um, work. And we also found this in some of the focus groups we conducted where immigrants uh, believe that, some said that they believe that their children would have to pay the government back for the benefits that they used. Uh, language barriers also make this problem worse. About half of our immigrant sample uh, reported having limited English proficiency. So that kind of adds to these challenges. Um, and you know the immigration-related fears that we discussed um, also impact immigrants' likelihood to use public benefits. So yes, despite being lower income, immigrants are no more likely than their US-born counterparts to use public benefits uh, based on our survey. Thank you. Um, and though that, you're I, saying, though you're saying, you kind of would expect them to, given their lower income. Given their lower income, um, no. you would expect higher benefits use. No. Uh, um, and yeah, okay. with that, I will hand it back over to Samantha to wrap up. Yeah. Um, so as I mentioned at the outset, this uh, survey project, uh, this initial round, was conducted in conjunction with the LA Times. And in coordination with our release of the initial survey reports, they launched um, a series of stories, including a front page story um, in the Sunday paper. 
and uh, as well as a, a library of digital assets, um, including additional stories, as well as some interactive tools. Um, and they're continuing uh, to report off of the survey data set in their reporting uh, now and going forward. And I think together, this really illustrates the combined powerful impact of having data and storytelling together. Um, so I think this is a really great example of how you can combine data with storytelling and get a really powerful message. Next slide. So I just wanna close by um, hitting a few points about the importance and relevance of these new survey findings. I think we're already seeing a ramp up in what was already a high level of anti-immigrant rhetoric and that that is gonna only increase as we get even closer to the next presidential election. Um, and as these debates uh, around immigration um, unfold, what is often missing from them is the voices and experiences of immigrants themselves. And so I think what these survey data do are really help to center the voices and experience of immigrants, provide a much richer and nuanced picture of who immigrants are than is often portrayed in those debates. And I think the other takeaway from the survey findings in which the LA Times story really highlighted was the overall amount of resilience and optimism of immigrants today and the really vital role they play in our communities um, and in our economy. Um, we see from the survey a really um, more, more nuanced understanding of their experiences at work in their communities and in healthcare settings and including some of the challenges they face with unfair treatment and discrimination in those settings. And I think the data can help think forward to designing interventions, policies, initiatives to address those challenges that they face and also tailor those interventions and initiatives to meet the specific needs of um, parts of the immigrant community because they are not a monolith and everyone, um, there is a variation in experiences and needs. Um, and as I mentioned at the outset, this represents one piece of our broad broader portfolio of work um, and that it is a long-term project that we plan to continue with going forward. And with that, I'll close and we'll look forward to further discussion and also hearing um, from Chasey. Thank you. Um, I will ask my colleague, Kerlin Morales, if, if anyone's asked any questions that you could read out for us. Yes, so we do have one question and it would just be over how was the sample um, size selected and I think uh, you mentioned probability sampling but just more uh, around that. Um, I can dive in a little bit deeper on that. Drishti mentioned it's a probability-based sample which is um, how you achieve this nationally representative sample. So we used three different sampling modes. One was an address-based sampling mode um, one was a random digit dial of prepaid cell phone numbers, which is key for reaching some um, lower income households. And then there were also some callbacks um, to telephone numbers that were uh, previously random, randomly sampled for other surveys um, and were identified as uh, having uh, as speaking an English a, a language other than English. So we combined those methodologies to get our full sample. And people um, could respond in one of three ways. They received notice of um, the opportunity to participate in the survey through um, mail invitations um, or through calls. And then they could choose to respond either through a paper-based response, through an online response, or through a call response. And again, we provided options in 10 languages uh, for folks to be able to respond. So hopefully that helps clarify. There's also a full methodology in our report posted online if you really want to dive into the details of it. Thank you. Um, and I think you said at the outset you will be releasing the data eventually for public uh, use. Yes, once we correct? complete once mm -hmm. we complete all our planned um, reporting out of this um, initial round of the survey data set, we will make the survey data set available for public use so um, researchers can do their own analysis off the survey data set once we make it available. Great. Awesome. Okay, thank you so much. We have a couple other questions and we will um, 
save them for the fuller Q&A section so that we can move on to Chasty and the Protecting Immigrant Families Coalition. Hi. Uh, Hi. Everybody. My name is Chasty Anderson. I am the Deputy Director at the Protecting Immigrant Families Coalition. Um, and I am here today to talk about um, research and advocacy, even though all I really want to do is ask Drishti and Samantha a whole lot more questions, <laughs> but I'll, I'll hold myself back and maybe uh, lure them to a presentation at an upcoming research working group meeting. Um, okay, can we go to yeah. my first or second slide, I guess? Mm -hmm. um, just for those who aren't familiar with the Protecting Immigrant Families Coalition, just some background information. Um, uh, PIF, we call ourselves Protecting Immigrant Families. Um, our mission is to unite to protect and defend access to healthcare, nutrition programs, public services, uh, and economic supports for immigrants and their families at the local, state, and federal level. So it's a very big ambition. Um, and it is uh, an ambition that is matched by um, the enthusiasm of our many members. Um, we have over 650 active members in 43 states plus DC. Um, and we do our work, well, in a lot of different ways, but the one of the ways that our membership engages most actively is through our working groups. Um, we have a communications working group, a community education working group, federal advocacy, state policy, and most importantly for the purposes of today, a research working group. Um, one last thing I do want to say about uh, the PIF coalition is just um, about how we became a coalition. We found we were founded in uh, 2017 um, with the public charge leaked draft, um, and initially were a camp. We were a campaign that was very laser focused on that one issue. Um, over time, we have diversified and grown um, into now a coalition where we run campaigns, including public charge, but on a host of different issues at the federal level and also um, at the state and local level. Um, next slide, please. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Um, okay, so our research working group, the history is in 2017, uh, shortly after uh, Trump was inaugurated. There was a leaked draft of his pu proposed public charge rule, um, which uh, struck, you know, it was a it was a, a loud moment <laughs> in policy um, and had a reaction in in communities as well. Um, PIF was formed, and part of uh, the campaign effort was to form a research working group. It was very obvious very early on that there would be a huge need for data. Um, and for communication among researchers and advocates to make the cases we need to make and have the research we needed to push back where we needed to push back. Um, there were both challenges and opportunities in doing this. Um, I think the challenge was twofold. Um, within the research world, there was something of a tendency to be a little careful, a little protective of data, of methodology. Um, there was there's limited funding. There are people who you know some territory considerations. Um, I was not uh, with the PIF coalition at that time, but my predecessor Renato Rocha did a um, wonderful job of bringing together a group of researchers and carefully creating a very collegial uh, shared space for collaboration. Um, there are also a lot of opportunities um, that having this research working group presented. Um, one was just quickly assembling some of the best, most recent, and most pertinent research to support opposition to Trump's public charge rule. Um, having this conversation with researchers saved advocates a lot of time. Um, just being able to have a conversation that says, we need research that says this, that shows us this, that indicates these things, and having a team of researchers being like, I'm working on this, my colleague did this, um, was a, an effective way of getting um, uh, closing that gap, right, of, of uh, finding efficiencies. Um, there was also the opportunity of, of producing research very quickly. Um, our colleagues at the Urban Institute, for example, um, early members of the research working group and still members of the research working group. I think I saw Hamatal um, in the Q&A, so hello. Um, and Urban puts out its annual well-being and basic needs survey um, very quickly, they they 
started incorporating an immigrant population oversample that would test the chilling effect. And that chilling effect data point every year has been um, one of the most useful data points that as advocates we've been able to use um, to show the need for the, the work and the, for the policy changes that we have been advocating on behalf of. Um, that was one example. Other research followed on its heels. Next. Thank you. Yeah. yeah. Do you mind if I ask again, like, what kinds of data were you looking for? You know, you knew this change was potential change was going to happen that could affect how many people get public benefits. So were you looking for those changes immediately? Were you looking for what was the use prior and after? Or what, what were you thinking? What kind of data were you looking for? Um, I think the answer to that question is probably yes and, right? Like uh -huh. we're looking for what is currently, what is the use? What are, you know, state policies that are, you know, limiting enrollment at the state level? What are policies that um, enhance enrollment? Um, we were looking for change over time. Um, we we're looking for polling data on, you know, what impact the news was having, right? I mean, if you'll remember back in time, um, initially, the leaked drafts were um, extraordinary draconian measures that included everything from, you know, Medicaid down to uh, uh, free lunch programs at school, which, you know, of course didn't make it into the final rule. Um, but the the fear factor was was intentional um, and and widespread, and misinformation was widespread as well. So we were looking for data that that would enable us to sort of walk the line of what is true, um, and also identify what was changing as a result. And the fear factor would be that if if immigrants used any of these benefits, they wouldn't have been allowed to become citizens, right? Like that. Best in case. lay in lay terms, that was yes. the big <laughs> concerns, mm -hmm. right? or to be right. Uh, what we call the chilling effect, which is where exactly as you said, um, uh, immigrant families or mixed status families are leery of enrolling in public benefits. Um, due to immigration related concerns, um, which are sometimes very specific and sometimes amorphous. Mm -hmm. Okay, thank you. I'm turning to the next one. Great. Okay. Um, data and advocacy. So um, the inherent challenge is, is that researchers don't do advocacy, right? And, um, and so there were some, uh, problems, right, or some misalignments, let's call them misalignments. Um, the need for advocacy is immediate, it's urgent, um, and it shifts with, the, with uh, the changing winds of policy and rhetoric and uh, all those other things. Um, so one of the misalignments is that when we have a question like, what have our immigrants going to stop using public benefit programs it, in in the research world it takes years to answer those questions right to come up with the kind of data points that allow you to um uh, illuminate the answer um so it takes years to produce it it takes years to uh, do the analysis and publish it and go through the peer review process um then it it gets published but maybe in a professional journal that doesn't get read by advocates um so that was one of the misalignments, the, the need for immediate data versus the need to take your time and do it correctly on the research side. Um, a great example of that is that currently in this year, 2023, um, there is so much research being published on the immediate impact of the uh, of Trump's election or, or the rhetoric side, right? Or the leaked, public dra um, leaked draft of the public charge regulation. Um, shortly after his uh, inauguration. But that data, is, while it's wonderful, has taken five years, right? So um, constantly like just doing everything we can to close the gap um, and to give researchers a window into what would be useful for advocacy if that's something of interest to them. So uh, the solution is, you know, an open channel of communication. Um, we do monthly meetings. Um, our, I'm one of the co-chairs. Um, David Kalik is another co-chair, and uh, Juliana Zo at CLASP is um, another co-chair of the group. We um, at, invite people to give presentations on their papers, um, to come to the research working group to talk about, um, you know, bumps in the road or ask for questions. Um, basically to create a space where researchers and advocates communicate, where they share ideas and ask questions of each other. Um, 
one benefit is just the brain trust, right? If I can use that, maybe air quotes and brain trust, but um, it's just a huge opportunity to get the input and assistance um, to solving some tricky questions um, uh, or to helping other people solve their tricky questions. Um, it also often generates new ideas, right? Uh, somebody will come and give a presentation on recently published research and the, just the questions in the conversation often um, help seed sort of second generation research questions on that same project. Um, I can give some examples. Um, I wanna be careful of time here. Um, I'll give an example very, uh, I'm sure everybody um, on this webinar is uh, familiar with the Medicaid unwinding and PIF um, as uh, an advocate for um, immigrant communities was very interested in um, seeing if there was a disparate impact um, on immigrant families. Um, PIF was able to express that need in research working group um, meetings. Um, a member of the working group responded with a concept. We tweaked it. We, you know, shopped it around. We found some funding and it's happening now much faster than it would have if it would have happened at all. Um, so that's just sort of an example of the way that um, the, the, the space provides for that, um, quick turnaround, quicker turnaround time. Mm -hmm. Um, I mentioned second generation, um, research ideas recently. I think you may have been there, my soon. Um, there was a conversation, uh, a presentation by Natalie Slopin, um, at the Harvard School of Public Health, um, on Latino, on health outcomes for Latino children in, um, benefits generous states versus benefits thin states. Mm -hmm. um, and there was some surprise at one of the findings, um, the perception of alienation. So um, respondents to her survey had um, expressed a lower degree of alienation um, in Texas versus in New York, where that was um, the inverse of what uh, stereotyped expectations might have been. And it was just a really great conversation about why, what, what is that feeling of alienation? Why, where is it sourced from? Mm -hmm. um, and uh, Dr. Slopin went away from that conversation, I think, with some great ideas for, for follow-ups to that study. Yep, I remember. Yes, <laughs> it was fun. Mm -hmm. uh, next slide, unless you have another follow-up yep. question. Next slide, please. Yep. Um, so this is just a sort of a summary slide of some of the things I've talked about before, um, what success looks like for a research working group like this, this, this uh, coming together of the, the Venn diagram of where research and data can, over, can intersect uh, and overlap each other. Um, I think PIF is, I think we're uh, rightfully proud of the space that, that um, has been created with, with the researchers that participate. Um, it's collegial, it's supportive. Um, as previously mentioned, we're seeing um, some quicker turnaround possible on immediate data needs. Um, we've been able to get feedback from, you know, uh, some of the best and brightest minds in research on our own data collection um, efforts. Um, and as a result, we're getting more effective advocates. We're able to do more effective advocacy because of that ready access to uh, some of the, the those great minds and the, and the new research that's been published. Um, we have some advocacy going on right now at the federal level that is um, leaning heavily on some of the research that we've um, interrogated this year in meetings. Um, and yeah, so future possibilities, um, I think, the, the same, we need data and are constantly looking for innovative projects, new research, new membership. If anybody is not a member of the PIF Research Working Group and is interested, um, my email is on the next slide and I would welcome mm -hmm. any outreach. Um, we need data on impact of, you know, of lifting the five-year bar. We need that disparate impact um, assessments for the Medicaid unwinding. We need more data on the housing crisis um, with recent arrivals. Um, and then there are some possibilities for things that we haven't done yet that are that I think would add to um, what we have accomplished. Um, you know, publishing an annual roundup, an annotated bibliography of type of, of a sort that that could, you know, just say this is what we're interested in. This is what we've been talking about this year. Um, and then, uh, you know, potentially eventually organizing convenings. Mm -hmm. We have not done yet, but are thinking about. Mm -hmm. I'll be there. 
Um, <laughs> I, I think, you know, one of the things I like about your example is it's not only promoting policies that lead to healthier communities for immigrants, but also healthy environments for researchers. Mm -hmm. But, you know, we generally find that coalitions can increase the potential for more sustainable or longer term changes. Um, could you talk a little bit more about the power of coalitions and even including some of your members that are beyond the um, researchers like um, that can help really drive policy agendas to improve health and public health? We, we know public health tends to maybe be a bit more shy than other sectors in terms of engaging in advocacy for policy change. So maybe you could talk a little bit about more of sort of the power of coalitions in organizing yeah. for healthcare equity. Yeah, um, obviously um, I'm a big fan of coalitions. I see I have a three minute warning from Kerlin. So I'll be, I'll be- we're, Okay, we're moving from this into question and answer. So we're, oh, okay. so we're good. Yeah, yeah, we're good. We're not close to the end, so. Oh, okay. Um, <laughs> yeah. So I, I'm, I'm a huge fan of coalitions. I think that um, coalitions are hard um, because when you bring the better the coalition, the stronger the coalition is, the harder it is, right? Um, and the thornier the issue, the harder it is. But it's also integral to coming up to making the kind of policy change uh, that needs to happen. Um, one of the things that is of that is interesting, I think, and valuable about the Protecting Immigrant Families Coalition um, is uh, its cross sectoral nature. So. Um, I think breaking down those silos where health advocates talk to health, other health advocates and sometimes talk about immigrant families in the context of that and food and nutrition the same and housing the same, economic supports. Um, one of the things that, uh, that has made the PIF coalition as effective as it is, is, is breaking down those silos to the extent that we have of um, pushing for change, changes across the board in the way that, um, that safety net programs, uh, economic supports and other um, programs like that are available to immigrant families and how immigrant families are um, interwoven throughout. You know, um, I think one quarter of every child in the United States has at least one immigrant, uh, has at least one parent who's a non-citizen. Um, when you break it out into, um, mixed status families more broadly, the number grows. Um, there are very few people that don't have a stake in that huge chunk of the of the population. And mm -hmm. so um, coming together to talk about the issues that matter and the solutions that work is um is is it's just it's key to making the kind of change we need to make. Thank you. So do you have any other um, things you'd like to say, or should we open it up for Q and A more broadly? Uh, we have some good uh, questions. Yeah. yeah okay. Q &A. All right. Great. Um, Carlin, I believe that there was a question for um, KFF, or maybe a couple questions for KFF, and then we'll go. So we'll kind of go back to those, and then go to um, a question for PIF. Would okay. you mind? Yeah. Um, so the first one, I know we answered it within the actual Q&A, but uh, just out loud, in the comparison between California and Texas in terms of expansive health care coverage, where immigrants are more or less likely to have health care, are there more states like California or like Texas? Uh, yes, so you can find all the details in the report that I linked, but we did classify classify all states as either having more expansive coverage, um, which is, um, you know, states that have implemented the ACA Medicaid expansion to low-income adults, have taken up options in, in Medicaid and CHIP to cover um, immigrant children and pregnant immigrant women, um, as well as uh, other forms of state-funded coverage for immigrants. States, um, were other states were classified as being as offering moderately expansive coverage if they implemented the ACA Medicaid expansion uh, and took up at least two options available in Medicaid and CHIP to expand coverage for immigrants, including covering lawfully residing immigrant children 
or pregnant people without a five-year wait um, or adopting the CHIP unborn child option. And then um, the remaining states were classified as offering less expensive coverage. So states like te Texas that have not taken up any options in Medicaid or CHIP to expand coverage for immigrants um, and also that do not offer any state funded health coverage to immigrants. And by Medicaid expansion, it's not just in case the audience doesn't know, it's really not immigrant specific. That's more of like a income based um, determination, really. It just yes. happens that because immigrants are low income, like they would tend to benefit from it. So, right. Thank you. But yeah, it's great breakdown. I, I really like those charts. So the next question would be, I think, again, directed towards KFF, wondering whether increasing the sample size for some of the smallest languages is a priority for the next wave, or how are you thinking about that? Um, so I'll say we're still making our way out of the first wave. <laughs> um, uh, we have some additional reports that we're planning to get out uh, before the end of the year from this first wave, and then I think some additional reports um, that may come out early next year. Um, so I don't think we're quite at the stage of thinking about the next wave yet. I think we'll be doing some reflection um, on how things that went well, maybe things that were challenging in this first wave areas where there are still data gaps, um, and then using all that um, to inform what our approach will be uh, for the next time we go out. Thank you. Thank you. The next question um, would be, do organizations within PIF host some data training Training sessions. If not, is PI, PIF open to making this part of their efforts to connect data and advocacy? Um, okay, so do organizations within PIF, we have like 600, six, well, 650 organizations, so I don't know whether, I'm sure some of those organizations have done data training sessions. We have not, in conjunction with a specific partner, done any data training sessions, but um, as the coalition grows, um, I'm certainly open to making this that part of our effort to connect data and advocacy. That's, I think, a fantastic idea. Um, I don't know who the anonymous attendee is, but if you want to email me, um, my, I think my email is going to go up at some point, um, but it's chase D C H E A S T Y mm -hmm. at pifcoalition.org. Mm -hmm. Here are our emails. Yeah, and I and I think I think it's safe to say community science also does those kinds of trainings because we have been, yeah, been promoting the use of data by communities to really solve problems, and um, so that is also just to give a plug for that too. Um, thank you, Kerlin, or do you want to go on to the next one? And yes, and then. The fine, oh, we actually, what are, um, the next question would be, what are your ideas on how to change um, CMS lack of requirement to report if language services are provided to folks enrolled within Medicaid and uh, CHIP? Mm -hmm. So we are actively, I don't want to scoop ourselves. We have a project in the works right now. Um, so PIF just did um, a survey of states. We have a Medicaid unwinding task force um, and we did a survey through that task force of states um, that we are publishing the results to uh, next week. Um, and one of the questions we asked advocates was about language access, whether states were asking, uh, were providing language access um, uh, and got some pretty, you know, mixed results from states. Um, again, don't want to scoop ourselves, um, but uh, one of the things we're asking CMS to do is to address issues of, of language access, um, making sure that it is there and that it is there, but also meaningful, right? Like you can have a language access hotline as some states do. I think, um, was it Unidos that just about a month ago published um, an OCR complaint, Office of Civil Rights complaint, um, against the state of Florida because they had a, a Spanish language hotline. The wait time to speak to somebody on that hotline was four times 
as long as it was um, for the English language line. I've heard anecdotally from other states that they have an, a language access hotline, but it's, you know, it, you wait you wait so long that it times out until an English language person picks up again. So this is a problem that we've been um, spending a lot of time uh, thinking about and are actively advocating to uh, make improvements if it's if we can. I just want to add that um, we did some analysis prior to the beginning of the Medicaid unwinding that looked at um, language access on state Medicaid and CHIP websites and on their applications in anticipation of this being an issue um, during the unwinding. Um, so I'll flag that that's available on our website. The other thing I would just highlight is you know, there are pretty strong requirements related to language accessibility. So I think the issue is not that the rules and protections aren't there, but that they're not being enforced. Um, and so um, I think there there is a pretty strong set of requirements, um, but the question um, is around how they're being implemented and the enforcement mechanisms tied to them. I'm not sure if the question was specific to whether states are collecting language preferences on application forms, which I believe is um, varies across states. But um, I think there are some other analyses that have taken a look at um, how states are collecting language information as well as race, ethnicity um, information on their Medicaid and, and CHIP applications. Um, so there are some resources out there that I think provide a national picture of what that looks like. The next question would be be were there any analysis on immigrate immigrant mobility and connection to healthcare slash resources from jurisdiction to jurisdiction? Would that I think that may be for PIF um, in terms of your sample was one time too, right? They were and you were asking of their current location or did you did you do were there any issues with kind of how to classify people in terms of where they're residing or which state they fall in or they fall in multiple areas. If you're referring to the survey, their mm -hmm. basic state of residence, mm -hmm. uh, and it was asking about um, current experiences and experiences within specified time frames, but we don't um, specifically ask about whether those experiences were in their state of residence or not. Mm -hmm. Well, I really want to just take a moment to thank Chasey and Samantha and Dishi, and please note her email address in the slide is missing the P at the end of that Drishti. Um, but thank you so much. You know, I've really been honored to be part of the researcher work group. I think it's a great example of how we can all work together to create um, structural changes to policies that can enable better health. And then then we have the questions of implementation and so on and so forth, but at least um, it is a place to come together and really think about and strategize how to do that. And um, I'm very grateful to everyone who participated in today's call in terms of the attendees and thank you for your questions. Um, please let us know if you have any questions through email afterwards. And we'll be following up with uh, the webinar slides and the tips sheet afterwards. So thank you so much.